As usual. This microphone, Dodi, when you you have to hold the button, the blue button, yeah. so this blue no. button. When you're recording, you when you let go of the button, then you talk, okay? And then when you press the button again, you'll be able to do stuff with it, okay?
Uh, my name is Yoko Shioya, Artistic Director of Japan Society. Thank you so much for coming. And um, this is really a very uh, unusual setting that we have here. I mean, this room is quite often um, used for lectures, and then, but usually it's lecture, lecture, or sometimes play reading. But surrounded by this uh, cool gadget slash instruments, it's really the first time. So I'm so excited. <laughs> And it's so great to, uh, you know, surrounded by all these new instruments, amazing thing, and filled by filled with so many people who are interested in these strange things. So um, anyway, the today is an artist talk, and we will have uh, uh, the three artists here tonight. All of them are Japanese, and then uh, only one of them based in Japan. Um, Takuro Mr. Ribit is the artistic director of STEIN and um, um, he curated the whole thing and I started to talk with him more than two years ago to have this and, uh, tuna, uh, this setting and tonight talk and tomorrow's concert of course and then he is the one who will moderate uh, tonight's show I and mean, tonight's uh, talk then uh, the Makino, Makino kun will uh, also participate, who is also a participating artist for tomorrow's uh, STEM concert. And then for, as a guest tonight, Adachi, Tomomi Adachi, uh, he is actually based in Japan, but um, um, he is, uh, he happens to be here in New York City under the, uh, the, the fellowship of the Asian Cultural Council. And he's known for creating very, very interesting uh, uh, electronic music and a voice. So why don't we, we, we thought that why don't we move here, and take advantage of the fact that he is being here. So we will have uh, three artists, Japanese artists, uh, who are always, who has been always active in electronic music and improvisational music, experiments in music. So please welcome three artists from where, anywhere? <laughs> oh, maybe you are the only one. Okay. He's so, Taklo, and he will probably. He, okay. All right. So from here, I will let everything um, him do whole thing. Thank you. really great that we could show sort of the diverse activities that we do um, at this institution, which is a really unique place. Um, that's why I live in Holland. Uh, we do different kind of um, uh, activities supporting artists um, in different areas. And some of the stuff you see are, are just a small part of, um, of the stuff we do. And um, it, it wouldn't be possible with the support of Japan Society and also the Dutch Consulate in New York and also the, um, the Amsterdam funds, so we're very grateful for that. Um, so for today, I thought um, each of us would sort of uh, talk about our own work for about 15 minutes, um, kind of introducing our backgrounds and how we uh, make our work. And then after that, I thought I'll, um, all three of us um, will kind of have a discussion about uh, working with electronics, working in experimental music, and also working um, sort of uh, three areas, uh, three countries, um, US, Japan, and Europe. And actually Europe is, what, is the place that we all intersected and it's a very different sort of situation there in terms of art and just of like the funding structure. So we'll talk a little bit about sort of the, um, the, the context of the work. Um, so my name is Sukuru a little bit. I also, my artist name is Nikita. And um, I'm a turntable musician and uh, since 2007, I've been an artistic character of science.
my introduction to making music. Um, I didn't really come from sort of a musical family, or I didn't really learn a, a instrument or anything like that, but it's really through popular culture and mass media, it's a lot about sort of when hip hop was entering the realms of uh, film and um, uh, just the general uh, public's mind. And for me, it was, it was sort of, a, uh, as, a, as a young teenager, it was very interesting that it was a way to become a musician and a performer through my listening. Uh, I was always listening to music, but I never picked up an instrument to play, so I never thought I would become a musician. But suddenly there was this whole area that my listening could reflect to actually performing. And that's sort of been the basis of my work. Um, uh, that's a consistent uh, aspect. Um, so I wanted to become a DJ. Um, in reality, it looks more like that. <laughs> um, earlier on, so I was DJing, but also it came clear that in order for me to play the music that I wanted to, or to be a bit more expressive in um, sort of the songs that I choose, that I had to organize uh, the events themselves. I had to organize the spaces. I had to sort of curate um, the, the events um, and not just um, go and show up and DJ somewhere. Um, so, I grew up mostly in Japan, um, and from the late 90s, I started uh, organizing events in Tokyo. And two of the main events were uh, Anti-Gravity and Disco Smash. And Anti-Gravity was sort of a club event that we did every month, and Disco Smash was themed around food. So we would serve food and then um, curate the music, and the, the performances based around different themes of food. Um, and this process also was sort of my first introduction to technology. Um, I started designing my own flyers, and again, um, without any kind of training, by like just getting some free software from somebody I could already start designing things on my own, and so these new possibilities were opening up for me. And somehow in the back of my mind, I thought, well, you know, if I could use a computer, I'll be able to achieve some things that, um, that I want to do. Um, there's pictures some of the And then also, I was very conscious of how my music was distributed and um, was presented. So I, I made mixed CDs, um, but rather than sort of trying to distribute it through regular uh, channels, I was sort of um, selling them at smaller stores or giving them out as coasters at some of the events that we were um, doing. And, um, so I was thinking of different ways to just spread my music. And this was before all the kind of social media um, uh, social network and software stuff was, was coming up. Um, so after after being in Japan, I, I wanted to focus more on, on performing, and I was thinking of how a DJ could be a musician, um, how they could perform more close to a musician. And also just, uh, you know, again, thinking about technology, of how um, you know, being interested in the possibilities that what, what I could achieve by, by studying it. So I, I moved to New York. 2002 and studied at NYU at the IPP program. And there I was um, learning a lot about electronics and um, both hardware and software and started to experiment with um, sort of making my own instruments. Somehow I felt that um, on the commercial market there wasn't anything that I wanted to use, so I decided to make my own things. Um, so just different objects. Um, so these were all sort of tools for the DJ and they were made kind of custom built boxes with a Max MSP um, program that I wrote and I was performing with these. Um, but then around 2003, I met this Michelle, and it was the first time I saw somebody using 
a unique instrument that you know he thought and invented himself, but he was actually kind of achieving something new. It wasn't sort of just an imitation of an existing music or existing genre, but he was able to create you know, his own music, his own voice, um, uh, through a whole process of thinking about um, how to perform and how to do that instrument. So that led me to come to Stein in 2005. And just a quick background of Stein, we're a uh, government-funded art organization, and we support artists in many different ways. So we have the artist in residency program, we have facilities for people to come in, we have studios. Um, artists come to us with all different tasks or questions, and we basically help them out, and it's usually related to And a very sort of strong uh, character of what we do at Stein, and also what I feel personally, is that rather than having this division between making music versus playing music, and I think this is sort of a, a, a common problem today where when you make composing music on the computer, you're working with a different environment and a different mode than you're actually going to perform it. Um, and for me, DJing and you know making tracks on the computer was just two different worlds. It was really uh, you know, very far separated. So um, I wanted to think of how I can make music through playing music. And that's exactly what Stein sort of does. And you know, some of the central ideas is that you know, what we deal with is this very specific slice of time called performance time. We call it real time or the now. And this is where all of our criteria, our design decisions, all those stuff kind of boil down to. It has to be stage worthy, it has to be stable, it has to be you know, uh, quick and responsive. Um, and through that, a lot of sort of customized instruments come out. And the sound's been around since 1969. So it's a very sort of traditional instrument, an uh, inst institution. Um, but still, you know, we have tons of people coming to us saying that I want to perform music in a more physical way, I want to break out from the laptop just standing in front of it, um, but perform it more uh, gesturally and um, uh, just in a new way.
three videos. The first one was DJ Cuber, who's from the sort of battling hip hop DJ uh, turntablism. So there's a really strong focus on virtuosity and on this technique. Second was Otomi Yoshihide, who's an experimental turntablist. And the techniques um, are not so important, but more about the sound and also about improvisation and also about pushing boundaries. The last is Max Roach. Um, and so I'm very interested in this period of sort of free jazz where um, they started deconstructing uh, structure, but also they started examining uh, the instrument. And so a lot of uh, musicians started looking at the instruments of how they could be soloists and how to sort of extend the possibilities of their own instrument. Um, and so I'm trying to think of, you know, what is the turntable as an instrument? And essentially it being sort of a playback device, and how do I play a playback device? Uh, what is the meaning of playing the turntable? both referring to it as sort of an instrument and also something that plays back sort of recorded media. Um, and so I sort of used a system that I built on my own. And, um, <laughs> um, so you'll see some of that tomorrow if you come by. Um, and uh, my work at time, so, um, I sort of represent the institution by doing this kind of stuff and then uh, organizing concerts and events. And it's a really great um, place for me at the moment because I'm able to, again, combine all my backgrounds of, in Japan, sort of organizing events and then performing and um, sort of combining those two again. So this is a picture of something I did in the Chinatown in um, Amsterdam where we used an empty storefront and built stages um, and uh, audience members could see it inside and outside. Um, so tomorrow there's a concert. Um, so next I'll pass it on to uh, Yutaka, who will um, talk about his work. So when I encountered this material, article by Smithson, um, I was really interested in the idea of synthetic math. So math don't have to do mathematics, but the idea of synthetic medium was really quite interesting for my uh, creative thinking. So synthetic system, I call it my new medium or new instrument, um, because of my background as it's, it, I said science, but it's specific in my background is art science and environmental science. I always get fascinated by this idea of system of any sort. Um, I will show you a couple ideas. So synthetic, synthetic system is for me, it's abstract aesthetic system. Um, so I'm not really based on any specific systems like natural systems or social systems. I'm rather interested in more like rule-based, the rule which is defined by artists, myself, and the creative system, not the recreation of the system which already exists. So there's a couple examples which really inspired me for the last couple of years. Um, this one is with nasty volcano eruption in Chile. Um, there's some updates from Iceland. 
again in the as one, you can read the name of the mountain, how to see it. Uh, this is a tornado. It's always happened in the Midwest in America. And uh, if you have if you ever seen a uh, storm chaser, storm chaser. <laughs> another one is the dust storm in the nineteen thirties. And this is a bit different, but if you look at the scale of the human figure and the size of this crystal, it's I think this is the biggest crystal ever discovered. This one happened in Mexico last, no, it's 2008. And next one is uh, spider web. Uh, it's amazing thing about, about this spider web. It's just, uh, the, the spider created all things in two weeks. Just in two weeks. And another one, um, it's a BBC documentary called Swarm. It's, it's really well done, but it's kind of silly. Animals can sometimes reach such numbers, they defy our understanding. They seem to rise up and invade our lives. They become super swarms, so immense they're impossible to ignore. From the outside, they can be the stuff of nightmares. From the inside, we are a thing of beauty. As we enter the heart of the swarm, we will discover what happens when they meet our world.
So each system that showed is consists of tiny component or particle-based systems. And each particle or agent is interconnected together. So it's one um, behavior can affect the entire system. So if the temperature differs, the all the cloud formation differs, the crystal, um, their shape can tend to maximize their stability in the temperature. So I call this behavior of a mass as a second nature. So each particle has their own nature, but as a collective, they have a second nature, which is kind of different from the, each individual particle. So for my work, I have three criteria. Um, for it's, up, uh, it's applied to my sculpture, installation, and composition of some performances. Uh, first one called self-formation. Um, I mainly use a computation medium, which means software or application of any sort. So the moment of execution, the system, normally in Photoshop, if you open it, nothing happens. But my system tend to have um, its self-driven processes. Once I open the software, it start immediately starts some kind of formational processes. The kind of one it's called information. Um, so the system never stays in stasis. It's always in dynamically uh, changes its configuration or behavior itself. And finally, so. I'm not really looking for any specific form, but I will try to find a form in this process. So it's never the uh, any specific uh, goal, but always it's happening. So as my practice, I, as I mentioned, I do a couple other things: um, sculpture, installations, uh, compositions. So this is my sculpture work. Um, as I showed you, it's a natural system that says one behavior for that kind of uh, behaviors. This one was a <coughs> rather abstracted swarm algorithm. I, I created this system in computer, and when I open it, this kind of process starts and slowly kind of forming uh, this type of shapes. So basically, I freeze the moment on 3D print. The 3D print process is commonly used for product design or architects to uh, rather than making more noise, spits out actual sculpture in the machine. Uh, this is a different angle. And another one. So from there, I was interested in how I can create the sound with those shapes. Uh, these are the shapes I created in different systems. But how I make sound from these uh, shapes are there's a kind of scanner, the virtual scanner, the read the surface structure to turn it into sound. I can show um, a video. So those surfaces um, so those surfaces are called ISO surface. I think you should have ever seen them such as a brain scanning scanning image or some type of CT scan. So I use a particle to create um, some shapes and I apply this uh, it's called ISO surface algorithm to create this curvature which comes uh, become this shape. I was thinking about it playing my composition, but uh, I'm hoping you guys come tomorrow to show you my music so I know how to play it. So for my performances, I use uh, another system which is based on the particle uh, systems. The particles are interconnected 
yeah, as I mentioned in my criteria. Um, so each particle is a sounding particle. So th these particles kind of fly around in my, dis my system to create a sound all together. So it's not really, really about the shape, but actually the collective behavioral particle, which each has its own sounding to themselves. So the <coughs> idea of a particle flying around in the space is not really a new idea. Um, in, even in the 1930s, uh, Composer de Reyes already mentioned in his article, uh, New Music and New Instrument. Just talking about the flying, the sound kind of flow, uh, flowing like a river in space, but how actually execute this idea into actual physical space. Um, the last maybe four years, I've been working with a special sound system called wave field synthesis in a couple different countries. First one I worked with, it's called the Game, uh, Game of Life Foundation's wave field system, which consists of 128 speakers. So audience <coughs> sits in the middle of this uh, wall of speakers. The great thing about this system is you can locate sound in like here. Now you're not hearing sound from the speaker, but you're hearing the sound from here. So it's really, really precise uh, sound localization process. So the 2008 and 2007, I'm now kind of based in Berlin. I work at the Technical University of Berlin. They have the uh, world's biggest wave field system, which consists of 2,700 speakers. Um, you can see those great lines in the horizontal plane. Um, if you uncover those uh, great things with all speakers, um, so what you can sit in there so I can locate my sound particles at wherever I want. Really fascinating system. I hope you have a chance to come to Berlin to experience it. Um, another thing, um, I'm currently a PhD researcher at the University of California, Santa Barbara. We created a place called uh, Allosphere. It's, it's a three story high um, structure. It, in the middle, there's a metal sphere. And there's a project that covers the entire sphere, and the speakers are kind of wrapped around the sphere. So this is a sketch, but actually this was made in 2008. We are currently working on this customized network system to control all kinds of hardware speakers, projectors, and everything. So you can see the uh, kind of bridge in the middle of the sphere. There's a railing. Actually, these are the whole railing is the <coughs> sensor system. So this entire sphere can detect where the spectators are to kind of give you some kind of uh, parameters to control the entire <coughs> system. So this one might have a wave field system, but we are still developing different type of systems at this moment. So that is my presentation. Thank you. Uh, I thank for Japan Society and this time and also uh, Asian Culture Council, so they brought the invited here. So, uh, should, so actually I, I will have my performance today, not tomorrow, so uh, maybe 30 or 40 minutes later. So I don't need to talk so much now. <laughs> so just now I'm thinking what I should talk. So yes, uh, I'm performer, composer, and uh, making self-made instruments and original interfaces for my performance. And also I'm making video piece and uh, installation, and also I'm a sound poet. So now I will introduce some of my works, but I will present your performance later, so I will talk about mainly my voice works. Um, and uh, I will show some video recordings. Uh, and I didn't use any electronics for these performances. Now I will show you. So, but 
you can understand how my interest are connected with uh, home made idea of uh, home made instrument and original interfaces. So this, yeah. Uh, so this. Also, 
I'm focusing on visual and theatrical elements of the music, so especially gesture. So now I'm speaking something, so my hand is moving like this, so what is this movement? So, so about technique, so when you perform self-made instruments, you don't need traditional technique. So, but you, maybe you need to develop your particular techniques for them. Also, my original interface intended to show musical processes uh, visually. So it is uh, my context for style and electric music and the homemade instrument and the original interface. So I will present this kind of thing later. So this is my presentation. Thank you. So Kitaka and Tomomi, we've had a style several times and we've all sort of, well, I've played with both of them in different projects. Um, but maybe I could start by asking you guys um, that I think three of us have a different relationship with uh, technology, uh, the way we deal with it. At least for myself, I could say that um, it's always sort of a struggle for me. Um, before I, I studied in New York, uh, I, could, I could send emails. Um, I could barely tell the difference between CC and BCC. And that was sort of my level. And through the process of um, studying, it's, it's more for me sort of a, a inspiration and, um, I'm never I'm not in it to so much to become a good technician or programmer but I like to go through the process because it surprises me and also the mistakes that I make I find are often interesting although it doesn't solve the problem it somehow creatively or musically uh, satisfies me um, but maybe I could start asking uh, Yutaka who actually has a science background but, but so what, how do you think of technology or how you use it in your work? Um, kind of, I started off with kind of hacking, like hardware and many things, um, like toys, you can, you can spell and stuff, those kind of toys. But I kind of slowly shifted toward hacking application, hacking system. So as I showed, um, I kind of hack the natural system or social systems. So that's kind of my way of hacking. So. I never learned to do proper program, programming or any type like hardware. I just always hack. Hacking is my kind of strategy towards kind of creating my work. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So, actually I can perform without any technology. <laughs> so, but, so, for example, so we are already very, very increased by recording media, so we cannot avoid their influence, really. And for example, now, um, for my performance, so I'm using voice mainly. So it's, it seems like kind of a primary prime medium, but it's not true. So, for example, so if you record voice and playback, so you can do it, and this kind, this kind of experience so change the sense of voice and the physicality already. So I, my intention is so my performance is quite physical, but after recording maybe. And also so in usual life, so we need any kind of laptop computer. So why I don't use it for performance? It's easy. It's been quite practical. Yeah. Um, also, I think the both of you have very different uh, performance styles. Um, Hidaka, when we play together, he's actually very present. But the piece that we see tomorrow, um, he won't be on stage. Um, and you'll see that uh, uh, Tomomi's performance will be very there. You won't miss it. Um, but maybe you guys could talk about your thoughts about performance, musical performance, uh, in a time when you know, bringing a laptop on stage is so common, and a lot of sort of discussions are about, you know, is it worth paying money to go see somebody behind a computer? Uh, what is musical performance? Uh, you know, what is the state of musical performance? Maybe we can talk about that. Sure. Um, so, so for example, I tried to play together as a duo for three years. Um, after that, I kind of changed my kind of type of uh, performing my pieces, which is uh, my 
presence is not the um, active role in the performances. Uh, rather, I want I want spectators to focus on the sound itself. So sometimes my presence, like I don't, I don't say I don't do anything, but I just kind of change the parameter on the computer, which has almost no gestures. So it's rather bothering me and audience to just my presence on stage because I just people to focus on the sound itself, it's competition itself. So that's how I kind of shifted my uh, own style. So also sometimes I write this performance without any gestures, so I don't take care about it. So if sound is interesting, it's good music, I think. But it's not my way. So my way is, uh, yes, for example, I was very, very influenced by uh, systematic conceptual art, so like 70s. Well, for example, if you think you know about the music of Tom Johnson, so he's a minimalist composer. So my interest about their music and their art is the uh, audience can see every process, and the audience can understand how, how this music, this art is generated. And I'm very, very curious to show such kind of process. And my way is to show them by as a visual element. So yes, I might change my direction, but now I'm doing it. Um, maybe we could talk about the context uh, that we work within. Um, I think a, a common sort of perception of Japanese music is that you, know, you have such sort of extreme um, music or a great uh, vibrant underground scene. And so sometimes people perceive Japan as this you know, super exciting, musically um, vibrant place. Um, in reality, you go there, musicians these days have to have a day job, which is a very tough place to be an artist. And at least from my experience of um, growing up in Japan and moving to New York, um, being in Europe is the first place where I don't lose money. <laughs> Usually a typical gig in, in Tokyo or in New York is that you know, maybe you're taking a day off of work, you're taking a taxi to the venue, you do your concert, and you get paid about $15 or $20, so you take a cap back, so you're like 40 or minus $30, <laughs> but you still do it. And in Europe, there's actually sort of a funding structure. Um, you could do a concert in front of nobody, and you'll still get euros or 100 euros because the venue and the organization is sort of structurally funded. Um, so maybe you guys could talk about, I mean, Yutaka's been uh, outside of Japan for a very long time. You've, uh, you were living in Holland for a while, but now, uh, and then you moved to the States and now you're in Berlin. And uh, Tomomi also um, uh, was very active uh, outside of Europe, and now he's been in New York for the last five months. So maybe you could talk about how your music works or doesn't work in Japan, how it doesn't work or doesn't work in um, abroad, and sort of why you choose this sort of nomadic um, yeah, uh, practice. Um, I never, I try to do something in, in Japan, um, so it's kind of hard to comment on those things. <laughs> um, I'm not in the States, i rather making work in the States for Europe, that's kind of over here. Um, but I think Europe has a better, as, as you said, Europe has a better funding situation where I can focus on work in some sort of period, which is really, really uh, rare. I know that it's, it's happened all the time. So that's the reason why I couldn't move back to Europe after being in the States. So, so you've given up and showing your work in Japan, maybe? Uh, I never gave up, just I never. Why? <laughs> 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 you want to make your parents happy? Like, you come to your show and... Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard to come in. Uh, but did you intend to perform in Japan recently? Uh, no. <laughs> I just... Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, so it's, Tokyo is quite a heavy, hard place for artists. Such kind of experiment independent, independent musicians. So 
Yes, but the situation is changing now. So it, the situation is not so simple now because uh, sometimes we we can get some fund. So if you write much paper, many papers, so it, it's possible. So it's changed quite in these five years, I think. So now economical again economical situation became a bad. I'm not sure about the next year, but still this year is uh, not so bad, I think. <laughs> yes, and if you get money for art, it doesn't mean you can make good art, of course. And sometimes in heavy place, in difficult place, so you can make better art. In case, I'm not sure. So, yes, so there is no, yes, it's true. So Europe is very good place to live as the artist. Yes, but there is no strong reason so artists must be in Europe, of course. And sometimes I'm surprised such boring artists can get money from the government in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> so it's true. Yes, so if you are good artist, you can, you should be in anyway. So I went to where um, you have a conversation with a musician or an artist. And, um, uh, you, you're talking to them, and then eventually you sort of end up talking about your day job. And you, somehow it just kind of gradually goes there. And then, but then you're, in the Holland, you never reach that point where you say, like, so what do you do during the day? And so I had to ask somebody, and they're like, well, I'm a, I'm a professional composer. I get commissions. And, um, and I think it's, it's um, there is a lifestyle there where you, uh, where you can be a professional artist, but also it involves a lot of administrative work as well. You're always writing grants. Yeah. You're always sort of committing to a system in a way. And, um, and maybe that's the downside of, of such a um, sort of a rich sort of uh, financial structure for artists. Um, maybe it's a good time to um, see if there's any questions from the audience. I have a question uh, it, on the same topic. How, does, how do you feel that uh, it affects you when, say, you are in Europe and you have like kind of this sort of freedom to to do what you want uh, artistically, and when you are strained financially in New York? How do you think that affects the the outcome of your like you you try to fit in? Like if you if you don't have enough money here, maybe you try to make your your music more flashy or something so people like and you sell more tickets, you think that affects you in that sense? Um, it's, it really depends, I think. Um, I live in Germany as a Japanese, as a foreigner, and for Germans, it's a completely different situation, supported by government. So that might affect the situation, but for me, it's my situation rather neutral, so not have to belong in politics in in art or musical world. So that's the kind of the case I'm in, I think. Uh, it's a really tough question, actually, because, I mean, life standards are definitely good in Holland. Um, we, people don't work as hard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I wouldn't say they don't work as hard. There's some of my colleagues here. They're very <laughs> I was 
living in Germany, so in Dortmund. So nothing up there. So just football, but I'm not interested in football. And uh, 